On today's viewing guide, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite franchises ever, Digimon. With the release of Digimon Adventure Zero to the beginning, what better time to go over every Digimon series, what order to watch them in, and what are the best starting points? Let's begin. It's Morphin Time! Hello, this is Sanad here, and welcome to my Digimon viewing guide. Like similar videos I've done for Power Rangers, Star Trek, and Ultraman, this will be going over every main series for Digimon, all of the important movies, and telling you what order to watch them in if you're interested in watching them. I'll also be providing recommendations for what I think are the best shows to start with, and where you can take it from here. Of course, like always, you could start with any Digimon show, but if you want to make sure you watch them in order, that's what this viewing guide is for. There will be chapter times in the description and along the timeline if you want to jump to a certain section to hear about a certain series. And of course, I will be going over the basics of the franchise in case this is the first time you're hearing about Digimon. We're going to have a good time, so you want to strap in, stay tuned, because this is going to be a heck of a video. But before we begin, if you would hit the like button, hit subscribe and notification bell so this video gets out to more people to enjoy Digimon, I'd greatly appreciate it. But let's begin. Shame. Before we begin talking about each series individually, let's talk about Digimon as a concept. Digimon stands for Digital Monster. It's a nice, like, shortening, combining of two words, that sort of thing. But Digimon in and of itself is a franchise that developed from a virtual pet. That original virtual pet had you raising and caring for a Digimon before sending it off to battle with other Digimon. It was essentially like the boy's equivalent to Tamagotchi, which it was a spin-off of. Now, that premise and idea was adapted into an anime, that first anime series being Digimon Adventure in 1999. But more on those in a bit. The general broad themes of Digimon is about connection and friendship, whereas other monster collecting franchises will have you sort of in the gotta catch them all variety or the make them the strongest variety. Digimon is more about creating partnership and bonding between human and Digimon. Digimon may be digital life forms, but they are fully sentient beings. And because of that, that is what holds together the entire franchise. It's the idea of connection and friendship beyond just physical means. And so a lot of the series focuses on the connection between the kids who partner with the Digimon and the Digimon themselves. And this concept is not just alone to, oh hey, here's these kids that can do with Digimon. The franchise has expanded to show adults partner with Digimon as well. And that is what I think has given it such a well-rounded experience, is that you can kind of grow up with the franchise in addition to enjoying it at pretty much any age. And I think that's what makes Digimon really special. And it's at its best when it taps into that multi-generational aspect. So the thing I'm going to do here is talk about specifically the Digimon anime. There are other Digimon mediums if you want to explore them. There are a ton of video games. There are, of course, the virtual pets. There is the Digimon card game that has been super popular for the last three years and has basically supported the entire franchise on its very wide shoulders. And if you want to get something more narrative-based, there is the current Digimon Seekers web novel on Digimon.net, and there's several mangas, including Digimon Dreamers, which is also on Digimon.net, with a very good English translation. So if you want to go explore that kind of side of the franchise, by all means, I highly recommend it. Especially Dreamers and Seekers. I'm quite enjoying both of those. But of course, we're going to focus on the anime themselves. But before we get to that, I feel like I want to address one of the biggest things in the room. Dubs versus subs. So now Digimon has been dubbed into multiple languages in different countries. There's even multiple English dubs. So what I'm going to talk about here is specifically the Japanese version versus the English North American dub. Because there are English dubs in Asia, but without proper information on those and without having actually watched any of them, I can't speak to them as dubs. But Digimon may have regional dubs depending on where you look. So there is options out there. But the biggest ones that come up when people debate which version of Digimon to watch is the English dubs produced by Saban Entertainment and then later Studiopolis under different studios, or the Japanese version, uh, the original. So I wanted to kind of speak to this. In terms of the original dubs produced by Saban Entertainment, which would be Digimon Seasons 1, 2, and 3, based on Digimon Adventure, Digimon Adventure 0, 2, and Digimon Tamers, I think all three of these dubs are terrific. They do a great job of taking the source material and adapting it to a more Western vibe. The dubs do have edits. They're not an exact 
audio switch from the Japanese version. There was some things cut for broadcast standard reasons, but not everything was cut. Character deaths are still intact for the most part, and some of the darker elements that come up in Digimon are mostly there. There may be some dodging around certain words that are used because, again, broadcast standards, but since Saban Entertainment owned the Fox Kids Network at the time, they could kind of go nuts with it. But in terms of those three shows specifically, the Japanese versions tend to be a little bit drier in humor, uh, more, uh, you know, different humor style. They don't crack as many quips in the Japanese version versus the English. But essentially, I would say if you want to start in a Digimon and you don't mind English dubs, and in fact you like kind of early uh, dubs as they are, I do recommend the English dubs for Digimon. But if you want to have the, the Japanese style experience, that is also available out there. Uh, though not always officially on the Japanese side, currently. Now, there is one of the biggest things that you'll run into is when it comes to the movies. So for the Saban dub of the first three movies, they are compiled together into a production known as Digimon the Movie. This is made up of the first three Japanese films. They did cut a lot out of the third film and a little bit out of the first two to make it work. So you may want to watch the Japanese versions to get the full story. Now luckily, Discotech Media, who's been putting out Digimon on Blu-ray recently, has announced a redub of the original three films closer to the Japanese version, but with still a lot of the kind of jokes and stylings of the original dub and retaining most of the original cast. And those will be coming out in 2024. So if you want to see those original three movies, you might want to wait till the redubs are available. You might have a cleaner experience if you're not used to the way that the Digimon the movie is edited. Now, after Saban Entertainment was sold to Disney, there was a transition point and Digimon Season 4, adapting Digimon Frontier, was a dub produced by Studiopolis, who produced many future Digimon dubs. The same can be said for movies 4 through 7, which were finally dubbed years after they came out with uh, most of the original cast by Studiopolis, and that was done to promote Disney Channel's airing of Digimon Data Squad, which was coming up soon. Those four movies are really hard to find online dubbed, so hopefully Discotech Media has plans to release those dubs on Blu-ray. I hope they can, because those dubs are pretty solid. And then that brings us to Digimon Data Squad, which did have a title change from its Japanese version, Digimon Savers, but once again retained pretty much everything they could. Some things were tweaked for Disney's broadcast standards, and that's just kind of how these English dubs go. Now, Studiopolis was in charge of the dub for Saban Productions' Digimon Fusion, which was a dub of Digimon Cross Wars. They did not dub the last 25 episodes, and they chopped out a lot of this show because they just had to visually edit and censor and edit and censor so that way it could air on Nickelodeon. And so because of that, it's not well regarded as a high quality dub. And being incomplete, I would say the Japanese version is probably your best bet here. Now, Studiopolis' dubbing continues under different studios, where Digimon Adventure Try, as well as Digimon Adventure Last Evolution Kizuna, and the Digimon Adventure Reboot in 2020 have all been dubbed more faithfully to their Japanese equivalents. Same music, same kind of character personalities, same storylines, not so many joke inserts, but still some line changes here and there. So when it comes to dubs versus subs for Digimon, it's all going to be your personal preference, and I hope that this information helps you in some kind of way. But let's take a look at each Digimon show, break it down, and talk about where to watch its movies in conjunction with its shows. So when it comes to the Digimon series, there are multiple timelines, like pretty much any major franchise, especially Japanese ones tend to do this. There is going to be a breakdown of each timeline. The main original timeline for Digimon is known as the Adventure Timeline, and then every series after has its own timeline. So we're going to be spending a lot of time on Adventure before tackling the others. And I just wanted to say that up front so it's not confusing. So we'll begin talking with the Adventure Timeline, starting with the original anime that started it all, Digimon Adventure. Probably the most iconic of the series, also because Bandai and Toei have been shoving it down our throats for the last few years, ever since its 20th anniversary. So Digimon Adventure, before it properly began, started with a film in 1999 called Digimon Adventure. This is a prequel to the series itself, and it premiered one day before the TV show premiered. So it is a beginning point in the time, and the beginning point of the release of Digimon anime. This film is heavily based on the Digimon V-Pet experience. It features two kids raising a Digimon from an egg all the way up to a champion level before having to battle it out in the city. And this film, while it seems like kind of a standalone thing that happens to feature the characters as younger kids, actually does come up into the main plot of Digimon Adventure. So it's kind of an important piece. Though if you don't end up watching it, the show will recap the events, as the children have forgotten this ever happened. And this is kind of an interesting film for that reason. It's also one of my favorites. It's beautifully animated and really well done. And this also was the first portion of Digimon the movie. 
Running for 54 episodes in 1999, Digimon Adventure, also known as Digimon Digital Monsters in the Saban English dub, was the very first series. The plot of the series is that seven kids are at summer camp and mysterious weather phenomenon have been happening. After it snows at the summer camp, they get transported to the digital world where they meet their Digimon partners. And that is where the adventure kicks off. And like the name Digimon Adventure, they go on an adventure. These seven original kids are basically each a little different. There's some different ages, so you have kind of the dynamic of like some are trying to like lead because they're older, others may not feel as confident because they're younger, and some of them may not be used to the outdoors. It's kind of an interesting mix of kids. And I think that that's really cool because some of them knew each other prior to the show, and so there's a bit of connection and friendship, but you see it build along the course of the series. It is a mostly serialized show and everything continues one into another. It's really fun and light in most cases, but does have its darker moments, particularly in the second half. And that is where our basis for Digimon begins. It's an adventure, they're trapped in the digital world, and they can't get home. But eventually they do, and that's when things really get interesting for the franchise going forward. The eight kids in the series are known as the Chosen Children, or the Digidestin. And these eight kids are having a special bond with the Digimon, and actually unlock the ability to Digivolve. Now Digivolution, or Evolution, depending on where you look, because even the Japanese versions using Digivolution these days, it's kind of like the bond between the characters. As it grows and it strengthens, the Digimon will become stronger over time. And it's kind of a neat connection that is made. And unlike other monster collecting franchises, it's not a permanent evolution. Essentially, a Digimon can Digivolve for a battle and then go back to their base form later, which is kind of a fun thing. And the evolution sequences are usually pretty exciting. Now, in 2000, there was a film release called Digimon Adventure R War Game. This makes up the second part of Digimon the movie. This film shows the Digidestin after the series and what they've been up to after returning from the digital world. It's also pretty interesting because some of them are too busy to be part of the main story because, yeah, life goes on and that's something that happens in Digimon. The characters progressively move forward. They're not exactly trapped at the kid age forever. The film's plot does involve a Digimon known as Diaboromon, and he is essentially an ultimate villain. He gets onto the internet, something we hadn't seen in Digimon prior, and the Digimon have to chase him down. And Diaboromon starts causing havoc throughout the internet-based world that is evolving. And that's another thing I love about Digimon. It's technology-based. The digital world, the overall use of technology and how Digimon can interact with it, it really does begin here showing the dangers of having a Digimon loose on the internet that has ill intent. And that, I think, is what makes the film so exciting, especially towards the climax of the movie. If you are looking to watch Digimon Adventure, it is pretty well available on streaming with the English dub, but if you're looking for the best versions, the Discotheque Media Blu-rays are excellent. They are Region A releases, so keep that in mind if you are in other regions, but they have both the English language version and the Japanese. Two separate sets due to the different editing, but they've been cleaned up and remastered in a beautiful way. If you want to know more about these, go check out my video on the Digimon Home Video History, where I reviewed both of them and give you a lot of details there, but it's absolutely the best way to watch the show if you can get them. With the success of Digimon Adventure, a sequel series, Digimon Adventure Zero Two was released. In 2000, lasting 50 episodes. This would see a sequel taking place three years after the end of Digimon Adventure and features the entire cast returning. However, six of them are gonna be just supporting roles while Takiru Tike and Hikari Kari are upgraded to main series cast where they were younger in the previous series. They're now the same age everybody else was in the first series, but they have veteran Digidestin discounts because they have been around the block already. With the four new Digidestin being Daisuke, Davis, and his partner Vimon, Miyako, Yoli, and her partner Hawkmon, Iori, Cody, and his partner Armadillomon, and then Ken and Wormmon. This dynamic is really cool. Four of the main cast are new to this, two of the main cast are kind of more experienced despite being around the same age, so it kind of makes an interesting group. And they expanded the digital world not just in the digital world, but in the human world, by introducing other Digidestin and chosen children from across the planet. Other kids got Digivices and Digimon partners, and that becomes a main theme of the series, including the fact that there are more than just your main cast having Digimon, and I think that's such a cool idea. It kind of puts the thing of, you don't just have to be a chosen child to get a Digimon, you can be anybody, as long as you have the heart to be a Digidestin. Now, if you wanted to just jump right into Zero Two without watching original Digimon Adventure, they basically recap anything you need to know. Any kind of plot point comes up, 
they'll recap it in 02 before they go forward with it, which I think is really great and does make it user friendly. Now, of course, the two series do pair well together and they are part of the same adventure saga and 02 feels like a true sequel, bringing all the characters together by the end. And that is what I really do like about it. The first Digimon Adventure 02 movie was Hurricane Touchdown Supreme Evolution The Transcendent Digimetals. That is a long, long name. This film was kind of an awkward release in Japan. It was part of the Toei Animation Festival, where they usually put three short films together into one theatrical presentation, except this was part one and part three of that presentation, so the movie just has a break in the middle where they put another thing in, so it's still a theatrical film, but it's technically two parts. And the other awkward part about this is that it's debated whether or not this movie is canon. Uh, Digimon producers officially has said this movie is canon, even if the continuity doesn't work out. All these events happen, just may not be the way that they are presented in the film. And that is followed up with the fact that there is a movie exclusive, Chosen Child Digidestin, in the form of Wallace slash Willis and his partners Terriermon and Kokomon. Wallace slash Willis himself shows up in future adventure material, so the movie can't be non-canon, but the events don't quite work out. This movie is the longest Digimon movie of the original era because it's about 70 minutes. But in this, you'll notice some continuity hiccups. But if you can look past it, because there is some weird time travel stuff and some weird, like, things going on, it does add to the adventure universe by adding another element in the form of Wallace Willis. Also, calling him Wallace Willis sounds like that's his name, but I'm just using both the Japanese and English names here. Now, if you do want to watch the film in conjunction with the series, watch it after episode 21. That's kind of the nice break point between when we start, you know, kind of end one arc of Zero Two before we go to the next one. It slots in okay. It's not going to fit, like I said, continuity problems, but the film is still canon. Now, the second Zero Two movie fits a lot better. That is Digimon Adventure Zero Two, Diablo Mon Strikes Back, also known as The Revenge of Diaboromon. This is a movie that takes place after Digimon Adventure Zero Two and features all 12 chosen children slash Digidestin working together like their cohesive friend group and unit. You'll know why that's significant later. But this film is one of the kind of lost dubs because it was one that aired only on Disney Channel early in its lifetime and not like available later for whatever reason but seek it out if you haven't ever seen it. It's a blast. Diabormon comes back from our war game, and they have to take on a stronger, powerful Diabormon, who is now in the real world. And that is what I love about this movie. It's got a lot of great things, and it feels like a good wrap-up for the Digimon Adventure Saga. Now, that wasn't the end of the Digimon Adventure Saga, because while that was pretty much it, and they moved on to a new series in 2001, there was more follow-ups many years later. If you are wanting to watch Digimon Adventure Zero Two, the dub version is streaming, the Japanese version is not currently officially streaming, but Discotech Media has announced that we'll be releasing both the English and Japanese versions on Blu-ray in the coming future. Digimon Adventure Try, which was the return to the Digimon Adventure Saga, providing us a third series, but this time released differently, as opposed to a weekly TV show, it was a six-episode OVA series, essentially making up six movies. These films are Reunion, Determination, Confession, Loss, Coexistence, and Future. Much like Digimon Adventure Zero Two, Hurricane Touchdown, Supreme Evolution, The Transcendent Digimentals, it's canon, but the continuity is a little screwy. Uh, first things first, it is Digimon Adventure Tri, so you'd think it'd follow up from Digimon Adventure Zero Two. It kind of doesn't. It essentially takes place many years later, and sort of contradicts the epilogue to Zero Two just a bit. It's understandable because the epilogue at the end of Zero Two showed a future 30 years out. So going, you know, five or six years later, it's not gonna screw it with it that much. So the series itself for Digimon Adventure Try focuses in on the original eight Digidestin chosen children from Adventure. Taichi, Tai, and Agumon, Yamato, Matt, and Gabumon, Koshiro, Izzy, and Tentomon, Sora, and Biomon, Mimi, and Palmon, Joe, and Gomomon, Takiru, TK, and Potamon, Hikari, Kari, and Tailmon, Gatomon. So while there was a reason given that Daisuke, Miyako, Iori, and Ken weren't in Digimon Adventure Try, they were captured in the digital world, the other eight kids pretty much ignore that fact and never question what the heck happened to them 
which seemed really odd considering how well they work together in Zero Two. Like, I get that they're kind of two different friend groups, but not even, like, Takeru and Hikari were like, hey, anybody heard from Daisuke lately? And so because of that, Digimon Adventure Try is a little bit awkward for some fans. If you didn't like the Zero Two kids, it probably works for you. If you did, you probably feel annoyed for about three years of your life as it comes out slowly but surely one movie at a time. It also introduces a new character in the form of Mako and her Digimon Mekumon. Yeah, they're kind of fun, but because of that, it's a little bit dubious in the continuity department. There are things that happen here that don't line up with even Zero Two, and uh, it kind of feels like they sort of just jumped from adventure to try. So because of that, it's kind of a hard watch, but again, canon, just not in continuity. If you are wanting to watch Digimon Adventure Try, all six films were released by Shout Factory, singly and in a six pack on Blu-ray and DVD. And then there are also is streaming options available. And these include Japanese and English audio, so it's all in one because the dubs are using the same music and editing style. So after Digimon Adventure Try, more movies were produced for Digimon Adventure. So in the lead up to the new film Digimon Last Evolution Kizuna, five shorts were released in kind of a Kickstarter campaign, which was a little weird, and it can be kind of hard to find these, but they do provide some really interesting stories for fans of adventure, and I wanted to mention them here. These are five shorts released only in Japanese, and they include To Sora, which is a prologue to the last Evolution Kizuna film, and actually has an important plot point in that movie, and I kind of don't like how it's just kind of relegated to this little short. There's also Hole in the Heart, Medical Student Joe Kido, The Desire Jogress Evolution, The Shibuya-ish Heroic Sada of Pump and Gatsu. Those five are kind of fun little extra things, and they add to the overall story. But of course, they were basically promotion for the 2020 film Digimon Last Evolution Kizuna. Last Evolution Kizuna does feel a little redundant, if I'm not going to lie, because this is a film featuring the older versions of the Digidestined from the Digimon Adventure series, going through the trials and turmoils of growing up and having to deal with how you fit Digimon into your adult life, which is kind of like how Digimon Adventure trials, but the trials and tribulations of growing up and how you fit Digimon into your high school life. Try took place a few years later. This takes place a few years after Try, and it now shows the Digidestined as adults. They are in their 20s. Again, kind of growing up with the franchise. In the film itself, it, it does focus on the original eight. However, unlike Try, the other four from Zero Two are in it, and actually, I think they're my favorite part of the movie. They kind of go off and have a Scooby-Doo adventure uncovering the mysteries of the villain behind the film. So it is an important film. I take this as the canon portion that Try does not totally fit in continuity with. I will say that this is officially the end of the Digimon Adventure Saga. However, it's not the end of the Digimon Adventure Zero Two Saga. If you are looking for Digimon Adventure Last Evolution Kizuna, Shop Factory released a Blu-ray in Region A with English and Japanese, and it should be available on streaming in some places, and I believe it just got a physical release in the UK, so it is getting out there. Uh, much like Try, it was pretty relatively easily available. Digimon Adventure Zero Two The Beginning, releasing in 2023. It just came out in Japan at the time of this recording, and it's going to be released in the U.S. in about a week, and I'm very excited to see this. As a Zero Two fan, this has got everything I'm looking for. This is a Digimon Adventure Zero Two movie, featuring all four of the new kids from Zero Two, plus Takeru TK and Hikari Kari, and it features a new story where they explore how the Digidestin came to be through a time traveler named Louie, who claims to be the first kid to be partnered with a Digimon. And so that's what's going to be the plot of the film, and that's all I know because I have not been looking at spoilers. It does not follow directly from Kizuna, so if you want to just watch this as opposed to Kizuna, probably, you know, it won't reference Try because it does seem to be entirely focused on the Zero Two cast, not the Season 1 adventure cast. So if you wanted to go ahead and watch this film, as you may be watching this prior to the film's release, you want to know what to watch ahead of time, you pretty much just need to see Digimon Adventure Zero Two, and uh, Revenge of Diaboramon, because it's a good film. Other than that, you can pretty much skip Try, Kizuna, and Hurricane Touchdown, as it seems like this movie's not going to really take into account any of that. But that is, for now, the conclusion of the original Digimon Adventure saga. Time will tell if we'll see another movie or series in this original timeline, but it's time to move on to another Digimon timeline. Next up, Digimon Tamers. This series is our first timeline shift. We have now entered a new timeline, completely separate from the adventure timeline. And that's something that not many people quite realized originally when it released in North America, 
because Saban just called it Digimon Season 3. In this universe, Digimon is a card game and video game which several kids enjoy, until certain ones find out that Digimon are actually real. And I think this was a great step to take for the franchise, because it had been well established at that point what Digimon was, and I think it probably made it really relatable for kids. I know for me it was, because, well, hey, these kids were in the same boat we were. Digimon was a card game and a video game. Tamers lasted for 51 episodes starting in 2001, but this series did take a different approach. It was a slower build-up to the Digimon sort of coming in. It wasn't like everybody was there all at once from the first episode, and that is kind of what the show did over time. The other interesting part is as opposed to starting with a Digital World connection. So for example, in Adventure, they all went to the Digital World in the first episode. In Zero Two, they could jump between the Digital World and the Real World at will. And then in Tamers, it actually started starts in the real world with Digimon emerging from the digital world to the real world. So a completely different style. And because it's a different universe, you don't have any returning characters. And that also means it's a pretty fresh start if you're wanting to jump into something that's completely standalone. Because Tamers is a standalone series. There were two movies we'll talk about in a moment, but other than that, it hasn't really had any sequels or follow-ups, though many fans do wish for that. Tamers is also a little bit of a darker show. There is a lot of stuff in the second half that leads into darker territory. And surprisingly, the English dub doesn't shy away from it, which is much appreciated, and is why those original dubs are so well regarded. But if you are wanting to watch Digimon Tamers, and also include its movies in its run, here's what you need to know. The first Digimon Tamers movie, the Adventurer's Battle, also known as Battle of Adventurers, sees the kids and the Digimon go on a bit of vacation to an island where they meet Takato's cousin, who comes up later in the Digimon Tamers series, which is why you know the movie is canon. Now, placing this movie is a little bit tricky because it was produced by different people who did the show, because that's typically how Toei did their movies. See Dragon Ball for another uh, convoluted mess of, like, which movies are canon? But for me, I tend to place this at episode 18, after the debut of the perfect slash ultimate forms for the Digimon, since those appear in the film. It's not a perfect placement, there is that minor, like, there's not really a gap in Tamer's story to slot this in, but you can just slot it in after episode 18 and fudge the details in your brain. It's not too hard, just enjoy it. The second Digimon Tamers movie, The Runaway Digimon Express, or Runaway Locomon in English, was a epilogue. So it takes place after the series, even though it came out during the series' run, and it does feature pretty much all the characters from the ending arc of the show fighting a runaway Digimon who is a locomotive. And it's got a really nice story that ties in with the characters. Without going into spoilers, some don't consider this movie canon because of the ending to Tamers, but for me, it is due to, you know, just implication, not so much, you know, spelling it out. You just gotta have to do a little guesswork, but for me, it works, and I do recommend watching it after the series. It's definitely a fun time. But I do recommend watching Tamers if you want to just jump into something that's a little less daunting. Like when you look at Adventure, we just spent all that time going over the Adventure timeline. It can be a little daunting. Maybe you want to start with one of the more standalone series. Tamers is an option. In fact, I could say that for pretty much the rest of the Digimon shows. In 2002, we got Digimon Frontier. Now, Digimon Frontier lasted for 50 episodes in 2002 and ended a four-year streak of Digimon anime. We'll talk about why in a moment. But this series took a completely different approach than prior Digimon shows. And in fact, if you like shows like Saint Seiya or Tokusatsu series like Kamen Rider Super Sentai, this might be up your alley. Because instead of having Digimon partners, the humans themselves use Digimon's ancient spirits to become Digimon themselves. There are no Digimon partners, but instead spirits. And essentially, the D-Scanner or Detector acts as their transformation device to these forms. And so what I like about Frontier is that kind of aspect of it. I'm a big tokusatsu nerd, and so I love that. Now, while Digimon Frontier is really unique in that aspect, it does kind of follow a more traditional Digimon adventure style setup. Kids get lost in the digital world and they have to fight their way back. But unlike other Digimon shows, they actually don't return to the real world for an extended period of time during the show's run. And to find out why that is, you'll have to watch it. So Digimon Frontier, Revival of the Ancient Digimon, also known as Island of Lost Digimon for the Disney Channel dub version, is kind of a weird one. It's legally canon, but personally speaking, I would take it out of canon. Not because it doesn't have a continuity problem, because it does. Uh, the closest place to place it if you want to watch it in the show run is episode 18, like after episode 18, slotted in there. There's a problem with uh, evolutions being accessible in that film where they weren't accessible in the show, and that could be explained away like, oh, because they're on this island, things are different or whatever. 
But the problem is, is that they have a different lore in this movie for the ancient Digimon than the show does. And so for me, it's not really canon. Uh, it's not like the others where it's like, oh, okay, a version of this probably happened in, in canon. We're just seeing a slightly different telling of it. This one's a little bit weird. So if you're going to watch it, uh, if you want to just slot it in and just roll the dice, go for it. If not, you could watch as a separate experience. And then that was it. No Digimon anime would happen for another three years. In 2005, the film Digital Monster X Evolution came out in Japan, and to my knowledge, it hasn't actually ever had an English release officially, nor has it had an English dub. This film sees a digital world in chaos after the X program has caused a virus to sweep through, causing damage to Digimon. And so X antibody Digimon are created to fight this, and it also features the anime debut of Dorumon, who eventually becomes Alphamon, one of the more prominent characters in the franchise. Now, the unfortunate part of this film is that it does feel disconnected if you're not up on your digital monster lore. So, for example, this film was a CGI film set completely in the digital world with no human element. It's just about the Digimon. It ties into Digimon World X or Digimon World 4, which had a lot of similar plot elements and story ideas. And it ties into stories of the V-Pet with the Digimon X and Digimon X Chronicle, which was a manga. So it was kind of like, it worked really well in the moment of like, oh, the next step of Digimon, we're not doing like a full anime, we're just doing this X storyline with the X antibodies. And the film works with that. But I wouldn't recommend just watching it on your own. It's really more for people that have delved into the deeper things of the Digimon lore and want to see some of the ex-antibody stuff brought to animation. But other than that, it's probably skippable for most people. Now in 2006, due to some of the success of the other merchandising efforts and of course the ex-antibody storyline, Digimon decided to attempt another weekly anime. Digimon Savers. Digimon Savers lasted 48 episodes. Unfortunately, Digimon Savers is stuck in between things. It came four years after Frontier and four years before Cross Wars and just kind of exists. And the only thing near it is the X Evolution movie. But this is my personal favorite Digimon show. I'll tell you why, as well as telling you about the show itself. This series would also see release in 2007, produced through the English dub Digimon Data Squad which I think it was kind of neat. They finally changed the names. It had been a few years. This series goes back to having Digimon partners as opposed to the kind of crazy things they were doing with Frontier and the crazy things they did with X Evolution. It's kind of more back to tradition, a little bit more like Digimon Tamers because things start in the real world with Digimon coming there and then eventually going to the digital world. But it does star the main characters of Masaru, a.k.a. Marcus, and his partner Agumon, who is different than the normal Agumon from Adventure because he's got red gloves on his hands and then he evolves differently which is kind of neat we have toma slash thomas and his partner gaumon and then we have yoshino with her partner lalamon they're kind of our main trio but they work for an organization known as dats who study and analyze and deal with digimon and digimon threats that happen in the real world and that is a really cool aspect because they have jobs they're a little bit older. Now, while Toma and Masaru are 14, even though they look way older, Yoshino is 18, and everybody that works at Dats are over the age of 20, so we kind of grew up with the franchise a little bit. Though I wonder if this was not as approachable to kids, because the only kid character in the series was Ikuto slash Keenan, who was a kid raised in the digital world. That's not super relatable for kids, I imagine. But that might also be why Savers didn't get a sequel or immediate follow-up. The series itself, though, has a different approach because while we kind of saw with Adventure and with Tamers that it's kind of like the idea that, like, as you grow up, you're letting go, you let go of your Digimon because you're letting go of your childhood. This show was like, no, having Digimon is cool and we're going to stick to it. And that's what I really like about it. It also makes a great starting point in case you want to have something different. If you're an adult who wants to get into Digimon, maybe go with the show that has the older characters. It might be a little bit more approachable than the shows that have the kid characters. Not to say that the show that has the kid characters is not as engaging, because it absolutely is, and the storylines they pull off in those shows is terrific, but Savers has a bit of a different quality by having adult characters have Digimon. Now, there was one Digimon Savers movie, Ultimate Power Burst Mode Activated. This film is non-canon. While they may try to fudge some of the other movies, this one has been explicitly stated non-canon, because Burst Mode works way different here than it did in the series, and none of the events really line up. So I do recommend Savers as a starting point if you are an older anime fan, because it might be just a little bit more approachable before you tackle other series. 
Either way, it's just, I love that show and I'd always recommend it. Next up, Digimon Cross Wars. Now, Digimon Cross Wars is weird because I think that a lot of people point to it as being the reason why they went back and did Digimon Adventure Try, because this didn't work, but this also lasted 76 episodes when you include all three of its seasons together, which makes it the most successful, like, show run wise But in terms of the actual series itself, this one shook up the formula yet again. Instead of having multiple kids with multiple Digimon partners, there was multiple kids with crossloaders. And the crossloaders would allow them to command armies of Digimon. And it ended up becoming like a warring army thing where one kid was the leader and had a bunch of Digimon. And then the crossloader would allow them to fuse those Digimon together. What's also interesting is there's two human main characters that don't technically have partners. Digimon Cross Wars aired in 2010 and lasted 30 episodes. This was kind of a basic premise. It was three different kids at three different Digivices and they were kind of working against each other and going through the battles. The series actually did kind of run to a nice conclusion before starting a time skip for its second season. This was later dubbed as Digimon Fusion Season 1 in 2013. In 2011, the second season, The Evil Death General and the Seven Kingdoms premiered and lasted for 24 episodes. This saw a bit of a format change where there was a villain group with the seven death generals that had to be defeated. But by the end of this, you have a 54 episode show that feels like a natural conclusion. And then there's a third season. Lasting for 25 episodes, The Boy Hunters Who Leapt Through Time is kind of a weird deviation. Because while we had Cross Wars had like, oh, each kid's in charge of a group of Digimon, this goes back to Digimon partners. So every kid has a Digivice and one Digimon they're partnered with. It also drops a lot of the characters from Cross Wars while introducing a bunch of new ones. So it's kind of a weird thing where it does feel like it's Digimon Zero Two equivalent sequel as opposed to just more continuation, which is why when people just lump all Cross Wars together, I'm like, it's a little awkward because that third season's really different. The interesting part here that I did appreciate was that there's not only a trio of heroic kids, but there's also a trio of evil kids. They're brats. They're just mean. And it's kind of fun to see Digimon and humans having partners and they're having to fight against each other. Also, the final couple episodes of The Boy Hunters Who Leapt Through Time features a massive crossover involving most of the original Digimon characters from the previous five shows showing up for a massive crossover. But that kind of brought us to an ending of that original era before things went on to Digimon Adventure Try, where they were picking back up the old era from the Adventure Time frame. And then, yeah, where are we going to get another new show? Now, I'm going to get some comments about this because fandom discourse is like this. But the next series, which came out in 2016, which was during Digimon Adventure Tri's run, was Digimon Universe Apley Monsters. Now, this show has been called by many, that's not a real Digimon show. I want you to look at the logo where it says Digimon Universe Apley Monsters. Digimon is right there. They're Digimon. Every character's name has a mon suffix like every other Digimon. They just happen to be phone apps, and the Digivice happens to be a collecting gimmick uh, sound box, which I liked. I have all the toys. Digimon Universe Apley Monsters was a completely different approach to the concept of Digimon. The digital world was a different thing, but it was still kind of there. The partner system still was in place. You had main characters with partners, just like you would for any other Digimon show. And yet, for some reason, people call it a fake Digimon show just because the Digimon are phone applications as opposed to... I don't think actually Digimon usually are applications. This specifically puts things in applications. You got a search engine, you got a fitness app, you got a music app, you got a hacking app, you got a, a camera app. Like, it's kind of cool and it kind of updates the Digimon concept for modern times and modern technology. You know, people aren't using tower computers as much as they are smartphones, so it's kind of smart. For me, this was kind of a return to form for Digimon, something that Cross Wars nor Try had really provided, and it's kind of sad that it sort of gets ignored. This series is only released in Japanese, but it is legally streaming on Crunchyroll in most territories, which is super awesome. And if you've never had a chance to check it out, I do recommend it. It's definitely not some weird offshoot. It definitely feels in line with the other Digimon shows. And now for the most confusing title of all time, Digimon Adventure, colon, 2020, Omega Mon Symbol. 
I don't know what to make of this logo. No one really does. Uh, most people call it Digimon Adventure colon or Digimon Adventure 2020. I usually prefer 2020. After trying something different with Athlete Monsters, after doing sequels with Try and sequels with Last Evolution Kizuna coming out like two months before this, they decided, why not? We sell Digimon Adventure merch all the time. Let's reboot it. Starting in 2020 and lasting 67 episodes, Digimon Adventure saw the return of the original eight kids in brand new designs with brand new voice actors, and the original eight Digimon with brand new designs and brand new voice actors. And on top of that, surprisingly, a brand new story. They didn't just rehash the original adventure story as the base elements of they go to the digital world and they have to travel around on adventures, but they didn't really rehash stuff after the first couple episodes, which was kind of impressive. In fact, characters have different personalities. Unfortunately, the show did last a long time and had a big old hiatus due to COVID, so it does feel like it got dragged out a little bit longer than it should have, but it did do new things and I gotta give it credit. The part I did really enjoy about this was that the evolution lines were not the exact same as the originals. While they had all their original forms that you'd expect from original adventure and try, they added in new evolutions that we hadn't seen these versions of the Digimon ever become, and that was super fun. This series also did receive an English dub, so it is streaming in Japanese and English on several platforms, and I'd say, yeah, check it out if you want. If you're looking for an introduction into Digimon, I don't know if it's the best, because if you're going to go into Digimon, I'd say, if you want to see the Adventure Kids, go watch Original Adventure, because, you know, you put Adventure and Zero Two together, that's 104 episodes, and some movies. This is 67, so it's not like it's shorter. Uh, it's not like one of those anime remakes where it's shorter than the original, so... I would recommend, you know, maybe watching this one if you want something different or if you're trying to get back into Digimon. It's kind of a good starter for that. Now, alongside this, they launched the Digimon card game, which is essentially financially bankrolling the entire franchise and giving a global audience to the point where we're getting more Digimon stuff than ever. And that included another show. The most recent Digimon series, Digimon Ghost Game. This was another formula break. Most Digimon shows, in fact all of them, are pretty serialized. You have an ongoing narrative and you start reaching closer to that goal and sometimes it breaks up into arcs. You may have one-off episodes here and there, but it's all leading towards something. Digimon Ghost Game is entirely Slice of Life slash Monster of the Week. This premiered in 2021, just in time for Halloween, and many of its stories are horror-inspired. Digimon coming from the digital world to the human world and causing chaos and destruction. It gets pretty dark sometimes, but it's for the most part kind of like a nice kids horror series. Now, the thing is, this did last for 67 episodes and did feature a massive delay in the middle due to the Toei animation hack. Boy, Digimon can't catch a break recently. <laughs> Though I will warn you that the series does spend a lot of time in doing standalone singular episodes that slow build to a ultimately rushed conclusion. So if that's not your jam, it may not be your jam. But the characters are super fun. Hiro, Kyoshiro, and Ruli, plus the Digimon, Gammon, Jellymon, and Angoramon, made a terrific trio of characters for the show, and that's what I enjoyed watching. Even when the show would sort of start to drag and, you know, kind of run in circles a little bit, I did enjoy seeing the characters. But if you aren't into super episodic stuff, it may not be for you. But with Ghost Game being streaming on Crunchyroll, it is pretty accessible, and if you're wanting something a little spookier to watch for your Digimon, it's definitely a good pick for that. So that is it for Digimon anime for now. Digimon Adventure Zero to the beginning is the last known Digimon anime project we know about, but with the card game trucking strong with Digimon Seekers, still providing more vital bracelet dim cards, these fancy Super CSA Digivices, the model kits, the action figures, Digimon definitely feels like it's not gonna go away as soon as the Zero Two movie is out, which is a good thing. Whether or not the next anime thing will be another movie or an OVA series or another weekly TV show, it's yet to be seen, but I have confidence that Digimon is going to keep going forward because it seems to be a success for both Toei and Bandai. And ultimately, that's kind of how Digimon goes. It comes in for a few years, it goes out for a few years. But right now, we've had a pretty solid run since about 2015. We've had, like, no breaks. It's really nice, and that's pretty cool to see. So on that note, I hope you enjoyed this guide and hope it was helpful to you. Hit the like button so others get to see it. Hit subscribe and notification bell so you don't miss out on future Digimon videos. Leave a comment down below. Tell me your favorite Digimon series or any questions you might have about continuity or order watches or recommendations that are more specific than what I gave in the video. 
If you'd like to help support the channel directly, please consider joining as a channel member for as low as $1 a month. There are uh, some awesome perks in there and some things to enjoy. And if you haven't checked out my other Digimon videos, please take a look because I've reviewed all of these Super CSA Digivices. And if you've never seen one of these magical things, you owe it to yourself to at least watch a video on it. So on that note, check out my live streams here on the channel, Mondays at 5 p.m. Eastern for Digimon News and more. Also come join the Discord server. We have a link in the description and I'll let you join. And you can join the Digimon exclusive chat known as Digital World. Also, you can find me on social media if you like, at Soundout12. You can find my Oscar awesome app designer in the Discord and on social media at DarkClaw643. You can find Hero Club at HeroClub.com for Digimon News and more. And until next time, this is Soundout saying goodbye.